Since 1983, fame has helped business and education work for Maine. Contact the authority, the finance authority of Maine. Welcome. This is our Afterthought segment where we keep our guests around from our broadcast show for a little longer discussion and hopefully some candid afterthoughts about the issues uh, that's only seen on the web. So with us today we have Jim Boldabook, co-founder of Blackbird Entertainment and uh, part of the uh, group that's putting together the casino proposal. John Williams, uh, executive director of the Oxford Hills Chamber of Commerce. Dan Cashman, spokesman uh, for Citizens Against Oxford Casino. And John Porter, president of the Bangor Regional Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and sticking around, um, I guess first I want to start off on. Uh, you mentioned someone mentioned during the uh, broadcast show that uh, there was a very similar proposal to this that was defeated mm -hmm. uh, two years ago. Is that correct? Right in 2008, and somebody said by by a narrow margin statewide. Well, I showed 55 to 45. I mean, it depends on who you ask. 46, 54. I believe okay. something well, like that. Okay. Yeah, that's close. close yeah. That's close, I guess, but not not a squeaker necessarily. No. Okay. No. So I guess the question I wanted to ask all of you too uh, is, um, conditions are a lot different now. Uh, 2008, uh, the whole world has changed since 2008 economically, obviously. Is that driving a lot of this? Is this is, how does that kind of new reality that we have economically change how voters are going, may uh, address and vote on this issue? I'm going to start with uh, the Oxford folks. Uh, I, th I think it has an effect. I don't think there's any question. And I, and, you know, and, and I think anyone would agree with the fact that in the state of Maine we're challenged economically. There's no question about that. Uh, certainly, from my perspective in Oxford County, as I as I mentioned earlier in the show, you know we have we have high unemployment in that area. What's the it's, rate? Up here? Uh, I don't I don't know what the rate is exactly. We're it's in double digits though now. Okay. Yeah, we're in double digits now, and uh, and again we we have the uh, uh, unfortunately we have the uh, stature of being number one in the state now when it comes to unemployment. But but here's the, here's my point, is that I've had people come into my office that uh, for example had jobs at uh, Oxford Homes for 20 years, yeah. 25 years in Oxford Homes closed and they have been unable to find regular employment since then and these are these are folks that have families they have children they want to live in the Oxford Hills they don't want to move and and they're looking to find a way to get back on the job track so to speak and what they're saying to me and what I'm hearing from them is you know John this is an opportunity it's an opportunity because it sounds like there are going to be multiple hundreds of jobs that are going to be created from this and, and we want you to support it, and we want you to get out there and push it. I'm going to turn to this side, yep, too. And absolutely. So what do you think about that? How does the economy affect this? And it seems like because the emphasis is so much on jobs. Uh, I, I think that gives a definite advantage yep. to, to their side because people are thinking about the economics, and it's an it's a easy argument to make. You know, I, I, would, I would point out that um, you know, the people who are opposed to gambling, uh, and you know, I've been skeptical in my career of, of, of gambling as an economic development opportunity. Yes. Um, you know, their, their arguments are not without merit. And really the difference is, do you have an operation that is managed well, run well, that is well positioned? There's a world of difference between, uh, you know, a gaming operation that is well run uh, by a reputable company and one that isn't. And I'm not suggesting that yours wouldn't be. But what I am saying is, is you want to be incremental. Uh, you know, the thing about Hollywood Slots was that it is an incremental proposal. And what that's been able to do over time is it's allowed the community to really test those owners. And I have to say, they have stepped up and they have been world-class owners. They have run a great operation. Uh, they are heavily involved in the community. They really are, are you know, uh, involved in almost every cause. You can always turn to them for a sponsorship. Um, and I think that incrementalism is, is, is an important part of how we want to roll out gaming in the state of Maine if we're going to do that. And, and the opportunity as it exists right now in Hollywood slots is really, you know, living that out. Okay. Uh, Jim, I, let's talk about that, yep, I, that issue of incrementalism I, I like versus to, the full-blown casino. If I could, casino. I'd like to comment on, on one of Mr. Cashman's comments a little bit earlier sure, on. absolutely. First of all, I'd like to say I, I, I agree. I think Hollywood slots is an extremely well-run organization and I think they've done a, a superb job up in Bangor but the reality of it is uh, that when you talk about monopoly uh, the only monopoly on casino style gaming in Maine is Hollywood slots they've been in monopoly since 2003 uh, we are according to Hollywood slots own people management people and comments they've made uh, our operation should not affect their operation uh, and comments to their tax rate being unfair uh, year-to-date Hollywood Slots is paying 45.9 percent 
of their slot tax revenue, and that's according to the Maine Gambling Commission of the reports that were far, we're proposing 46. So mm -hmm. our, our tax rate is almost identical. As far as the 100 mile limit, mm. uh, that is current state Maine, that is Maine law now and has been in effect since 2003. It's in, in place for Hollywood slots. So we simply copied that language and that was because a lot of Mainers said we want that language in there because we don't want unfettered expansion of gaming. So we really have a very difficult time understanding why Hollywood slots or mm -hmm. Penn National, their parent mm -hmm. company, is is going against our project. Okay. We can understand some of the traditional yeah. people. But. Yeah. Well, let's ask them. Sure. I guess point by point. Um, first and, and foremost, the 100 mile radius. Uh, that was in a uh, statute actually before Hollywood slots. That is a harness racing issue and it had more to do with uh, the uh, low supply of, of horses for racing than competition. Uh, apparently there were some issues when there were uh, uh, some harness racing dates being set with uh, multiple races being put on the same dates and there were not enough horses to do that. And that was uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in, in the statute for that reason and that reason alone. Uh, the original wording um, I have here said, a license may not be issued under this chapter at any commercial track located within 100 miles of a licensed slot machine facility. That means that you can't have uh, too many tracks for not enough horses. That's why that's there. It's not about commercial gaming. It's not about um, competition. As far as the monopoly goes, Hollywood Slots has said that they are not opposed to competition. They are opposed to the unlevel playing field that this create, uh, creates in bad business practices. We can't have an un unequal taxation. Um, their tax rate is set at uh, around 50% um, and there's a, uh, a rolling uh, cascade that, that goes into that with several different beneficiaries as your pro pro uh, proposal has as well. Um, but there's also the fact that they wouldn't be allowed to have the table games. Um, so what you're doing is you're telling one facility that they're not allowed to operate on the same playing field that your proposed facility would be allowed to operate. That's like having two restaurants in the same town. One's been there for years and the city's told them for years, you can't serve meat but a new facility wants to come in, a new restaurant, and they're allowed to serve meat. It puts this one at an immediate competitive disadvantage, even if they would like to serve said meat. Um, and the same goes for the taxation. If, if you have a lower tax rate on one than the other, it puts them at the competitive disadvantage, despite the fact that they've been operating in good faith for, for many years. So uh, those, are the, those are the issues that uh, surround this, and um, it's about uh, fair competition. It's not about a monopoly. It's about making sure it's fair and it's out there for, for anybody to compete on the same playing field. Again, you know, my, my response is that according to the Maine Gaming Commission, which Hollywood Slots files reports with, a year to date they're paying 45.9. I don't believe they've ever paid 50% in tax. Our proposed sales tax for slots is 46%. It's almost identical. And the 100-mile uh, rule is in the current law, which uh, the legislation for Hollywood Slots. So it is existing law. Well, now, I, yeah, just, let, me just, let me just say this. We have never in our bill prohibited anybody in the state of Maine, any legal entity, including the Hollywood slots, from acquiring table games. They simply have to do what we did. We can only speak for our bill. Yeah, we, we, can, we can only say, speak for our and own And I think that's what's interesting about this particular issue because clearly there was a movement to have more table gaming in the state. Right. Uh, uh, Oxford, Hollywood Slots, and Washington County. When that didn't go through, why didn't uh, Hollywood Slots pursue something, their own uh, a, a ballot item? Well, I, 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 don't, I, I can't speak specifically for Hollywood Slots yeah. and their motivation in, yeah. in doing that, but what I can say is that um, in terms of the, uh, the, the um, tax, uh, there's, with the Cascade, it's, there's a 39% uh, that goes to the general fund, there's 3% that goes to the host community, and then there's a 1% on gross revenue. That 1% gross revenue depends on how much money is actually put into the facility. And it's averaged out at around 50%. It's gone as high as 51%, I believe, according to uh, public uh, figures that are, that are out there. Um, so in terms of that, it is unequal because they've been averaging around 50% and it does move. There is, there is a pin that moves uh, because of that. Um, and in terms of the 100 mile radius issue, it's, uh, it is different because if, if in 2003 when there were two measures on the ballot, there was the one, the Racino uh, measure which passed and locally the only place that, uh, that passed it was Bangor. Scarborough did not, as we all know. Um, that uh, is, it was just for the, the uh, harness racing industry. That was to save the harness racing industry. There was another measure on the ballot for a tribal uh, casino gaming facility in Sanford. If that had passed and if Scarborough had passed their own facility, they would both be in existence today. Thanks a lot. Appreciate you being here. Thank, Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks Thank all. Thank you.